algorithms are the mathematical equations that deliver us content to our feeds. So if you scroll Twitter or you scroll Facebook or Instagram, an algorithm, which is like a big scary word, ah, the algorithm, but it's just a mathematical equation that takes your actions on the platform as variables and says, oh, you watch that cat video for a minute? You must really like cat videos. Let me serve you more cat videos. And it just spits it out the other end of that mathematical equation. And I think what we don't recognize is that social media platforms exist to make money, which is fine. No reason they can't do that. They have every right to do that. But the way they make money is by keeping us on their platforms for as long as possible. And the way they keep us on their platforms for as long as possible aren't necessarily good for our souls because these platforms are designed to deliver us more deeply into what we want, not deliver us from what we want. And so, of course, in a perfect world, we're all scrolling and tapping and watching in such a way that is honorable to Jesus and not engaging in fleshly desires of wealth or sensuality or whatever else. We're all still, even as we're in Christ, prone to temptation and sin. You know, we we scroll and look and dream about houses that we want. We come across pictures of a beautiful person and we're like, oh, they're a beautiful person. Uh, you know, like these and and then those are inputs, variables into the front side of that equation that those algorithms then say, Oh, you stop scrolling on that image for three seconds longer than you typically do. So we're gonna give you more images like that, which then drives you deeper into your desires in such a way that can be very unhealthy. And so that's one way I think that social media and the internet broadly, they give us more of what we want and we don't always want the right things. And sometimes we're blind to that. And so we can start engaging more and more down a rabbit hole, if you will, in things that we shouldn't be engaging in because to the world, they may not be objectionable, but to us, we know that we're coveting or we're lusting after someone or something or whatever else, and we're just being driven more deeply into that. Mm -hmm. Likewise, I think we often don't recognize that these algorithms are programmed to favor certain kinds of content over others. Now, the, where everybody goes immediately is like politi political stuff, like, oh, they favor this ideology over this one. Uh, there's plenty of stats that show that in some ways and also not show that in others. And we don't need to get into that. I think much more concerning is that these platforms, many of them have been shown to favor conflict and anger over peace and pleasure. So Facebook is one example. The Wall Street Journal revealed in 2020 that they did an internal study a number of years ago that showed that their algorithm favors conflict and controversy over non-conflict oriented and non-controversial content. So they so Facebook saw that research and said, oh, okay, maybe we should do something about that and never told anybody about it. And so because what they said was people who engage with controversial content stay on our platform longer. So in Facebook's mind, serving up controversial content that makes people mad makes us more money. And this is where like you... We just we have such affection for these platforms in a way because they connect us with our kids or grandkids and they show us funny cat videos and help us read interesting articles. But I think we forget that these platforms do not care about us at all. They just want our eyeballs and they'll do anything it takes to some degree to keep our eyeballs to the extent that they will serve us content that makes us mad just to keep us hanging around. Mm. And so when I've talked with pastors in the writing of this book or other lay church leaders, what I've found is they're feeling this like in their churches where people are just more contentious and they're more conflict oriented and they're challenging leaders in ways about and about matters that aren't even worth really challenging. And like a, a lot of pastors I talked with said, I'm just having more petty conflict in my church than I've ever had. And that's just one example I think of how that promotion of conflict-oriented content on social media begins to bear fruit in our offline lives. You're blowing me away over here. <laughs> I'm like, 
Holy cow. I'm connecting the dots. Honestly, I'm in my own because I do a YouTube channel and I yeah. I'm connecting the dots of why um, the algorithm is not pushing my content forward. And I yeah. guess I know why now. If you went on some political rant about some random person, you would yeah. get 10 times as many views. I almost promise you. And this is why and this is why, like, like, I don't like. I'm not trying to slander anyone in particular. And I, I tend to be, I, I, I tend to not ride a political line, no matter what my views are, because I think that the situation is so dire, but if you want to, like, if you want to know why some of the loudest voices on either side of the aisle politically, when it comes to social media and the media broadly are thriving so much, it's because these platforms are engineered to promote the most extreme sides of the spectrum, whether it's political or otherwise. Yeah. Um, and th they're just, they're designed to promote the extremes. And so those of us who maybe find ourselves not even in the middle ideologically, but in the middle, just in terms of like tone, how like I might feel very strongly about something, but I'm not going to like be belligerent about it. It's going to be a lot harder for my voice to be heard because the person who's belligerent is going to get way more attention. <clears throat> Yeah, because I'm going to just say this because there's a pastor that comes on and he basically started out as a very calm, you know, his, his his stuff was real calm and he's a radio pastor and everything and not not a really well-known one, but got on now and is like saying things like this is bad. Uh, this is this is uh, we're going down a bad road or anything that has to say that it's derogatory. He's putting in there and getting yep. thousands and th now before yep. he wasn't getting that. Now he's getting thousands and thousands of likes, thousands yep. and thousands of views. I mean, it just <clears throat> I thank you because I know there's a lot of women and men out there that are trying to put content out that is really not exploding like the these content creators that are you're talking about. So I thank you for your insight in that. And um, so how how can we use social media to direct others to Christ, even though it may not be exploding? Sure. What, 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 what tools could we use? Yeah, I'm very careful. And it should be said, especially after the nature of the conversation we just had, I'm very careful not to throw the baby out with the bathwater when it comes to social media. I think social media is um, bent toward brokenness and sin because it's made by humans and we're bent toward brokenness and sin. Um, but I don't think it's irredeemable or totally unusable. I'm not the kind of person who says, go delete all your accounts and never use these platforms. That's not, don't hear me saying that. I think when we have these kinds of conversations, it's really easy to ourselves fall into one of two camps slash put other people into one of two camps of like, oh, if they ever say anything negative, they think it's all bad. Or if they only say positive things, they must think it's 100% great. I I want to be very careful to say, I don't I don't think we have to be uh, I don't think we have to totally abstain from social media. I think there are ways we can use it for good. It's just going to take intentionality and effort. It's going to take work. And I think the way we do that is by, despite the fact that the, our, this content is not going to perform as well, um, shine the light of the gospel in these very dark places. So when you see people having conflicts in in Facebook comment sections or wherever else, if you know the people get them offline and try to help them resolve that conflict in an offline manner. You'll find very quickly that they probably don't even want to talk about it offline or, um, or step in and, and try to, um, you know, try to um, encourage, encourage more civil conversation, you know, things like this are helpful or just like posting encouraging content. Like I think, I think we need to be really careful not to take certain aspects of our faith online such that they are cheapened. Like, this is somewhat controversial, but like I'm not a huge fan of online church outside of when it's total necessity, a la COVID, or if you're homebound and you can't go to church. Like in that case, of course, something is better than nothing. But like I just don't like the idea of, you know, if you think about TikTok or Instagram reels of like pastors putting their sermons on there and I'm like, okay, a really serious three minute clip on Romans 8 and then a goofy cat video and then a video of somebody ranting about a political issue. And then an advertisement for dish soap and then another a clip of a worship song. Like, I think we underestimate how much some of these forms of media cheapen the richness of the gospel. Um, and, and I think it's just important for us to take that into account. 
Well, at the same time, I'm not, again, I'm not saying we should never do anything. I just think we should be incredibly intentional and careful and, and seek to just be more personal and personable with people as we engage online, creating encouraging content, like what you're trying to do. I run an entire website called Bible to life, which helps people uh, who are looking for answers to faith questions through social media and Google, because there are just an increasing number of untrustworthy places out there to find answers. And I think it's good for us to inject truth and light wherever we can. And the same goes for social media. I just think what, to your point about that, that radio passer I think is incredibly important as we try to create content in whatever form, whether professionally or just for fun, that we don't let ourselves get sucked into uh, appeasing the algorithm in such a way. I think there's some sense from a strategic perspective where appeasing the algorithm is good. Like you want to, you want to do, you want to be strategically wise, but not in such a way that it compromises your ethics or, or the message of the gospel, right? Like there's a line it, tailoring your YouTube video titles in such a way that they're more searchable is wise. Making a bunch of content that's inflammatory is not so great. <laughs> like, yeah. um, and so there, there's a line there. And so I think having, wisdom and discernment about how to use these tools effectively um, while not abandoning them entirely is kind of the route that I've tried to take. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I just want to have to say this one thing before we, we wrap this up is that, you know, a lot of people use fear in order to also, you know, get those views, get those likes, get the, you know, and um, so, you know, everybody has to be con discerning, just like you said, of what you're, what are you actually taking in? What do you, what do you, do you want to edify your soul or do you want and, and show Jesus or do you want to just, you know, move on and maybe do something else? Like you said, go out there, serve somebody, be in person. That's important. So, um, so Chris is, Chris is the author of several books, but mostly, most, most recently he published the wolf in their pockets, 13, uh, 13 ways the social internet threatens the people you lead. And you can get Chris Martin's book at moodypublishers.com. And um, where else could they uh, find you, Chris? Yeah, my newsletter that I write twice a week is at termsofservice.social. Um, whenever you're listening to this, I, I think we gonna be taking a little bit of a break from that come the fall of 2023. Uh, but until then, um, I'll be writing new uh, newsletters there every week. And an entire three-year archive of resources is there if you would if you would like to find stuff there. So yeah, terms of service social. I forget if you said this, but at Chris Martin 17 on Twitter is where you can find me there. And um, I'm happy to address any questions or other matters as, as you'd like. Okay. And the, again, the website that you said you have answers for biblical truth. Oh yeah. And, yeah. and I, that is Bible. Yeah. That's Bible to life.com. And that's what I do kind of with my day job through Moody publishers um, is we take little sections of our books that address some commonly searched questions on Google or things that are going on in the world. And we um, we take those snippets from our books and put them on as articles. And then if people want to read more, we we say, hey, this article is actually from this book if you, if you want to go check it out. So Wonderful. And what would you like to leave my audience with today? Yeah. Um, the final message, if I can say one more thing, I think is just um, whatever relationship you have with the internet and social media more broadly – um, take control of it yourself. I think it's incredibly important that we use social media and that we don't let social media use us. And that if we just coast and we don't think and we just turn our brains off as we scroll, which is, I think, modus operandi for a lot of us, um, we will be consumed by social media. But I think if we control our relationship by setting screen time limits, by um, giving someone else our passwords, by turning off all notifications so that we're using the platforms on our terms, not on the not when we're beckoned by them. I think there are plenty of practical ways that we can kind of grab the bull by the horns and own our relationship with social media and the internet. But like I said before, you have to try. It takes work because there. These platforms are designed to consume your time. And so if you do not pay attention, they will. And it, and it is totally in our power as adults to recognize this and to take these things into our own hands. And I would encourage anyone listening to, to do that. Do you feel the world around you is in turmoil? Do you seek perfect peace? 
God gives us that opportunity to put down whatever we're doing and come to him. And in Isaiah 26, 3, it says, you will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. When you devote yourself to God, you will find unchanging love and mighty power in your life, and you will not be shaken by the chaos around you. Focus on Jesus and trust in him. Do you listen to the call of God? Because God speaks to you every day. Are you listening to the call? Mm -hmm.